Galicia Kennedy, data scientist, uh, Horizon 2020 uh, funded Mariki uh, project led by Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna and uh, uh, the SOP Data Plus Plus project that is uh, uh, again funded by the European uh, uh, Union in this uh, very first joint uh, endeavor in a number of panelists on the subject we are touching today, which is the interplay between legal data. And, uh, and and data science. The whole idea here is to have more uh, less jurists and more data scientists talking about the subjects. Although we have a, a very uh, high level mixed basket of experts from uh, both uh, sides. Uh, I want to uh, steal any more of your time, and I will immediately give the floor to Professor Francesca Chiaramonte and Professor Gaetana Morgante, which are representing uh, the two institutes that somehow are backing uh, our projects uh, here. So, please, Francesca, you have the floor. Thanks for being here with us. Grazie, Giovanni. I'm actually very glad to greet this panel. It joins. Uh, 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 a well-established and, and very dynamic community that revolves around so big data plus plus they like to call it an ecosystem which makes lots of sense because it connects some very very different uh, um, settings and, and uh, realities and lines of research and the leads community the nascent leads community that we hope is going to grow as much and as uh, dynamically uh, I am also very glad to greet you because uh, uh, the interface between uh, uh, jurisprudence, legal studies, and data science is something that the Embed Department of Excellence has uh, uh, very happily and productively uh, hosted in the last several years. Uh, this Department of Excellence that I coordinate uh, uh, is actually funded by the Ministry for Universities and Research in Italy. Uh, it was born as an attempt within the Scuola Sant'Anna to support uh, data, massive data and computation enabled social sciences. And um, the initial focus was on uh, sciences within the economics and management domains, but our uh, uh, collaboration with the Leader Lab and uh, the, the line of research that Giovanni and his colleagues, Daniele, Denise, uh, whom you will hear about from today, uh, started has really taken off and has been thriving uh, um, within Embed. So I am very, very glad to to greet you and to uh, listen to this discussion today. I hope I'm going to have some useful comments to make along the way. So welcome everybody and um, let's enjoy this afternoon together. Gaetana. Thank you, Francesca. On to you, Gaetana, which is also not only the director of the Policy Institute, but one of the speaker of the panel. <laughs> yes, I am uh, overexposed <laughs> this afternoon, but that's it. So welcome and uh, uh, let me uh, greet you uh, in my role of uh, director of uh, the Policy Institute. Uh, the topic of today is a very strategic uh, uh, research line for the Policy Institute and uh, the Scuola. Um, I'm, uh, I'm very glad to, uh, to join this panel as a director and uh, as a speaker because it's a very paradigmatic, uh, let me say, uh, research line because of uh, its uh, interdisciplinarity between uh, uh, legal studies, uh, ethical and philosophical studies, uh, and uh, economic studies. Uh, so I'm also very, very interested <clears throat> in the uh, outputs of this uh, discussion uh, and uh, um, uh, once more um, uh, welcome to the scuola or um, even even if in this uh, very peculiar way and uh, um, uh, have uh, a good afternoon and uh, a good discussion. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, we are just keeping up with our time schedule. That's excellent. Uh, I will uh, uh, only spend very few words because uh, to the on the panelists because basically you uh, I'm sure you uh, all know uh, them. So I will just uh, basically repeating what is in the um, 
the flyer and, and move on. We'll uh, try to follow as much as possible the order, which is set in a way because uh, um, some of the panelists need to move for other meetings, other things. So let me thank in advance uh, all the, the panelists. As agreed, you have in between seven and 10 minutes to introduce the topics and, uh, and, and discuss so that we have also some few minutes for, uh, for discussion and questions and, and answers. This is also a, a, a good opportunity to start mixing different communities as uh, Francesca and, and Gaetana were uh, mentioning before. So the predictive justice community, uh, there's people working on uh, uh, the interplay between law and, uh, and, and data science from the, the, the need to work with data. And so we have the, the last community with, <laughs> with uh, Professor Palmirani, we have the predictive justice community with uh, uh, Professor Schwartz, uh, Professor Walker from uh, Alfred School of Law and Professor Sam Meluli from the Université uh, Laval, uh, all of them working uh, with us in uh, in this uh, vein. We have also the SOBIC data community to which we belong, to which also Professor Ferragina uh, from UNIP is uh, it's, uh, it's working. And uh, I am definitely indebted to my co-leaders in the predictive justice uh, project, which are in uh, alphabetical order once again, Denise Amran and uh, Daniele uh, Licari, that from their different angles, uh, jurist Denise and, uh, and data scientist uh, Daniele, uh, constitute a, a wonderful dream team on, on this project. We, we enjoy it very much. So I stop here immediately and I leave the floor to Professor Walker, to which uh, I am indebted for his early wake up in <coughs> USA and uh, getting in. Thanks, Vern. You have the floor. Thank you, Giovanni. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, you yes. can. Yeah. Uh, because I don't know exactly, well, I don't know much at all about where we're headed today. I thought I would start us off with a few pictures that will hopefully frame the discussion. Um, the overview, the access to justice web app components that I think we could all agree to. Get a pointer here. We need semantic data. Uh, and we need a place to make semantic data. And I'll talk more about semantic data in a minute. Uh, we need a factory uh, for making predictive models, machine learning, uh, deep learning, uh, that uh, consumes some of the semantic data, but also uh, helps produce the semantic data. Um, we need enough of that to populate uh, index databases, that should be plural, uh, and that interacts dynamically with end user interface. So today, uh, Giovanni asked me to speak about uh, semantic annotation. So I'm going to be focused on my pictures. Rather, we'll be focusing a bit on this production side of semantic data. And the end user interface I have in mind is legal reasoning. And we'll talk a bit more about that. So what we need is automated, accurate, legal semantic labeling. And what do I mean by semantic? Semantic labeling uh, captures the meaning or significance of text. And uh, by meaning, I mean, you know, probably what we more commonly mean, but significance is uh, more, um, uh, what do we use it for? Uh, what are the implications that we can draw from it? Legal semantic labeling, is capturing the legal meaning and the legal significance. And for our discussions, we can think of that as capturing the meaning and significance that a trained lawyer or jurist uh, brings to the text. Our goal is automated <clears throat> annotation of legal documents 
toward legal reasoning and argument. And the reason for the automated is because of the vast volume of legal texts. And we have to be able to scale that to the point where we can uh, make representative databases. Uh, and given the expense and difficulty and error involved in manually labeling all that data, it seems uh, literally impossible. So we need uh, these predicted models in current terminology uh, that will automate documents for us. But our goal is approximating expert in human concepts because we want to interact with the end user in the way, in a sense, that a lawyer would or a jurist would by adding le the legal meaning. <clears throat> Some examples for you to keep in mind, um, lawyers and jurists have factors or methods or principles for assessing the credibility of a statement in witness testimony or for assessing the trustworthiness of documentary evidence. Some of these methods or factors or principles we can dig out of decided cases or out of commentary or out of uh, expert experience. Another example, if we can assess the credibility of a witness statement and assess the trustworthiness of documentary evidence, then we, what humans do, what human experts do is detect conflicts, not just contradictions, uh, but some kind of inconsistencies in a broader sense between witness testimony and documentary contents uh, and methods for resolving them. So this is the main picture I'd like you to leave with you. Layers of legal semantic automation tasks. And we start down here with uh, tokens and sentences, uh, detecting tokens, detecting sentences within tokens, doing sentence segmentation within documents. Uh, and we want to end up over here on the upper right with arguments, what the human would recognize as arguments. Uh, assessing probative value of testimony and arguments and strategically putting arguments together into argumentation. Now, I'll talk about this uh, center in a moment, but I, I would suggest that over here on the left, um, the tokens and sentences uh, and labeling at that level is currently software capable uh, to a large extent. Over here on the right, we know that human experts are capable of detecting arguments, assessing probative value, and putting arguments together in strategic argumentation. The gap is how to get uh, from where we are with software to where we want to be. Uh, in other words, how do we fill in this middle? And we can guess at some of these steps. Uh, once we have sentences, we want to group them into uh, sets of sentences for various purposes. We want to be able to divide those um, group objects into types. We want to provide context and take into account the context around the group object. And that's on the way to emerging with something that a human would recognize as an argument. On the left, where we are is and, and what we need to do at each step uh, from the lower left to the upper right is bear in mind that software needs features, linguistic features that are detectable by the software but that are useful for semantic labeling. And where we want to get to on the right is what humans are capable of using abstract concepts and knowledge and use them routinely to interpret tests, uh, texts 
to extract the meaning and significance of text uh, and to um, do strategic argumentation. And my suggestion is that in the middle, how do we get there from where we are now? There's no current capability. Um, what I think of as the semantic analytics gap between where we are with software capable uh, capability and where we want to get. And my suggestion is that we don't know much at all about what's how to fill in those uh, yellow blocks in the middle, those steps. And it's because we have inadequate theory. Uh, we don't really, we have some theory about how humans do it over here. What the steps would be to get us from our sentence uh, classification tasks over here up this series of steps. I, I don't think we have adequate theory for how to do that, What, how to decompose the tasks, how to uh, perform the tasks with software. Secondly, uh, we have inadequate data for sure uh, that we in uh, these steps, we don't have labeled data that we can even use. Uh, and so the question of do we have the tools is a question mark because until we have a theory, till we see what data we need, I don't think we know whether we whether our current toolbox is adequate to the task. So this is the um, picture I want to leave with you: uh, the semantic analytics gap, and how do we get there from here? And that hopefully sets a stage for what I think is a very important discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Vern. I think you definitely set the stage and uh, and I and my my understanding is that uh, also the second speaker, Professor Meluli, will help uh, setting the scene for for our discussion from a, a, a rather different angle. Uh, is a, a, a computer engineer and, and a data scientist, which has been extracting uh, knowledge and for policy from from tweets from uh, from social uh, social data but before leaving the floor to uh, professor Menduli, i think we have for each speaker time for one or two quick questions eventually uh, uh, so that we, we we can have enough time also for a general discussion at the end uh, i will just uh, have a, a slight exception for cell because i know that he has a meeting uh, and so it won't be until the last with us. So, uh, is there any uh, immediate question for Professor Walker? All right. So we we we, we proceed. I have several questions, but 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 we have a meeting for the project at the end. So it's it's more internal discussion on what he said. So thanks again, Vern, for uh, the time being. We will get back to you uh, who are during the discussion. And uh, I now leave the floor to Professor Meluli. I just introduced you as a colleague from uh, Université uh, Laval, actually is my host here uh, for the time being. And we are developing uh, uh, some projects together related to this uh, topic. Thank you for being here. I know that you are also on vacation time, although you are still working. <laughs> a double thank to you and uh, you have the floor. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. Uh, and uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy and I'm really apologize for connecting a little bit late. Uh, I was in my calendar. It was 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Canadian time. So this is why. So I'm sorry about that. But I'm very happy to share with you some of the uh, research that you are conducting. I prepared some slides, and if you allow me, I will. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. I hope you are seeing my screen, my slides, and yes, uh, yeah. I'll go through them. Great. So I'll go through them and just present how we are uh, working on some research related to uh, data analysis, uh, how to inform policymakers from um, data that we found in uh, Twitter and uh, uh, Facebook. So uh, 
it's not a technical presentation, but uh, we can have time to discuss if you want with great pleasure, but just to uh, expose a little bit uh, what we are uh, doing. So I'm very happy to share with you this uh, research. So my, my uh, our, our main question was how we can bring the information from citizens to decisions or policy makers and how this social networks information can be informative uh, to our policymakers, how can it bring new knowledge uh, to our policy uh, makers? So this is the main question of our uh, research. So uh, information, it is very uh, scattered. It's very from different size, from different types and so on. So I gave two examples of information which are related to the two different projects on which we have worked. The first one is a project that we worked with the Quebec City. Uh, it was about reconfiguring uh, some part of the city, which is called the city of Limoilou. And uh, in this place, the city decided to build, to make new buildings and so on. So they decided to ask uh, the citizens, what do they think about this project? And people wrote around 1,000 or 1,200 messages to the city. And then the city asked the question, what can I do with this information? And the city said, I don't have resources to read, to code, to analyze all this data. So could you please help me to get some insights from this uh, data? The second one is uh, about uh, a, pay, a Facebook page, a Tunisian uh, Facebook page. Uh, which is about uh, people uh, revealing all issues, problems that they can see in the streets and uh, in their neighborhoods. And so people can post videos, can post photos, can write texts. And then the same question, and we worked with that with an NGO in Tunisia, who said, how can I leverage from this my web uh, Facebook page to make some, to inform policymakers about what's being said? This Facebook page has 1 million people following it. So the number of course is a huge. So we said, okay, then work with you. And this is this different two two different projects. Why? Because the first one is the data is in French. The second one, the data is in Arabic, Arabic written in French, uh, Arabic combined with the French language. So the challenge was a little bit more complicated to analyze this kind, this kind of data. But at the end, we did it, and we, uh, we've been able to inform a little bit the city about that and the NGO about that. So these are two main projects on which we, uh, we work. So the social media and any textual data can be structured and structured. Uh, and this is what we need to look at. The structured part of the data is the geolocation, the number of likes, retweets, and so on. So this, we can make the analysis a little bit easily. But the most important one is the unstructured data. And this is what uh, Professor Walker was uh, referring to, the semantics behind this data. How we can get insights from unstructured data, from textual data. How we can look at it, we don't know exactly what it is, we can have 1,000 pages. I can have 2,000 pages. Who's going to read them? Who's going to code them? Who's going to analyze them? So we need to a little bit some of the tools that uh, we can use for that. So what we did is really very uh, simple, simple between brackets, because as Dr. Walker said, we need to prepare the data. We need to identify the tokens. We need to clean the data and so on. But we have the textual data that becomes, this is our data collection. But the second challenge is that there are so many tools that we need to select a tool. So which one? And then we need to apply the tool to provide the data classification. And then we hope that the tool that we selected is really a good one. So this is our main uh, research uh, project. And then, we did the classifications, uh, we informed the people, we brought them feedback. But this is very, very challenging. And I will, I will join some of what Dr. Walker, Walker said in the, his presentation. There are challenges. The first one is the data itself. And the data itself, it has to be analyzed. 
So what are the elements that we need to consider? And there are at least, or in the minimum, three elements to consider. The temporal dimension, people can talk about time. They can say at 8.30 a.m. yesterday in 2012. So this is very informative information, and we need to capture it. The second one is the spatial data. Since in our research, we work on some spatial uh, data because we have a city, we have places, we have so on. So the spatial dimension is very important. And the third one is the semantic dimension. What is about? What the data is talking about? So people are talking about anarchic constructions. People are working about pedestrians. People are working about biking to the streets. So what are they talking about? And how we can think or imagine that? So this is very challenging. So this cannot be done from scratch. We cannot say that we are going to do it in five minutes. This, this part takes a long time. So this is the first thing. The second one is the most challenging, and this is very important. I said that we need to set, to specify a tool, to select a tool. But we never know if you are going to have the same data interpretation. This is it, Professor Walker, what you stated in your presentation, how we can interpret this data, how we can get the semantic behind this data. And this is the most crucial task, and it is not easy. And we need to be aware of that. So what we did is we worked with the Treasury Board of the Government of Quebec to show them the complexity of using AI in government. So they said, how complex is? This is the question that we received. So we said, we'll show you the complexity. We set up 24 groups, 24 groups. In each group, there are four or five participants. What we did, we selected the same data set, and it was a Twitter data set, and it was related to the environment and climate change. We brought the same data set the same algorithms, the same way of cleaning the data, the same things. And we ask people, now please, could you please play with the algorithm and give us your data interpretation? How do you interpret the data? We played with the algorithms. And believe me, we got, I think, 24 different interpretations of the same data. This is very important because we said to the government, be aware, because if you give the same data to two different groups, you will get two different answers. So you need to think about how we can get a unique or unified answer and unified interpretation, how we can bring uh, this common vision of the data. Otherwise, people cannot adhere to your strategies, to your uh, new policies and so on. So this is very, very important. So governments have to develop strategies on how data can be interpreted. This is very important because the interpretation will lead to policies. If the interpretation is not good, not sure you'll get the good policies behind that. So this, this impacts the policy cycle and the modeling cycle. And this impacts how we can how define the problem, how we evaluate policies, how we can listen up to people. And this also changed the modeling cycle with the, uh, the, the path from the problem definition to data collection. So this is, uh, these are some insights. So I think I have five or six minutes for my presentation. So these are some insights that I, will, I wanted to share with you. So to say that it is complex, it's not easy, there are two. We can challenge the tools, we can challenge the data. But this is very interesting because we need still need theories, still need some new algorithms. And so this is it, Giovanni and the friends for a short presentation about the work that we are. Thank you, Sal. I, I think that just already Professor Chiaromonte has, uh, has manifested their will to intervene on, uh, on the issue. Francesca, right? Has raised her hand has manifested her <laughs> will to intervene. <laughs> it's <a> very complicated. <laughs> no, I was just curious in this experiment that, that you did, um, 
were the signals in the data very strong or were they weak? In other words, there are settings where, you know, even in the most traditional uh, uh, way of using data in the sciences, there, there can be ambiguities about interpretations, right? Uh, especially if the data yeah, yeah. is a little ambiguous, if the signals are weak, so you can sort of see them in, in different ways. So was this a data set with strong, clear signals and people were just filtering it through their brains in a different fashion or were the signals weak? And so just to understand how serious the, the uh, uh, non-uniqueness, uh, non-univers, you need a, I can't think of the right word, but you know, how serious this um, multiplicity, ah, that's the right word is the other, in interpretation was. Yep. So, uh, so thank you, Francesca, for the question, for the point. Yep, this is, uh, this is a very uh, complicated task. And uh, as I always say to my colleagues in governments, the, this, this data that we can find, that you can retrieve from text, from social media, from everywhere, this is only informative. So you cannot only rely on this data. So is it weak? Is it strong? We don't know. The only thing that we know that this is something it was said. Who said it? Does the data is, is the data representative of what people are thinking about? I'm always saying to colleagues in governments, not sure. Because if you consider digital divide from the beginning, you have 20% or 30% of the population that you have inverted in this media. So you don't have the, the overall picture. You have a picture, but it is not the overall picture. Doing only data analysis from Facebook, Twitter, and social media is not so informative. And also the data can be biased by influencers, by other people who take the great place. So, so we need to take this data always with some bemoans, like, like we say. So it's only informative, but for policy makers, what I'm always advising them is to couple this information with other sources. Like they can do surveys, like they can do reports, memories coming from other experts and so on. And then they combine the data that they make and a, a, a more exhaustive analysis. But only focusing on this data, mm, it's not always uh, the right thing to do. So the data is there. We can use tools to analyze it, but these tools not always bring the same solution. We can use two different tools that you don't have two different results, two different ways of interpreting the data. So it always depends on what is the input, what do we need to do with the data, what kind of classification, what kind of things that we need to do. And then we come up with some uh, more uh, concrete results. Let me just to give a more concrete example. We conducted a study with the government of Canada about the reaction of people on tweets about the COVID-19. And the government asked for a sentiment analysis. They wanted to know what people are feeling when the government is saying the replies to their messages on Twitter. We conducted this for the federal government of Canada and for all the provinces of Canada. And this is very interesting because we showed them that the sentiment analysis itself is not complete, is not exhaustive. So we updated the sentiments. We added the new sentiments from the literature to the literature. So to show them that this data is not always exhaustive, this data is only uh, informative, and we show them. We analyze other data, not from social media. And we show them that the sentiment is different from what is expressed in Twitter. So we ask it, and we told the policymakers, please be aware, this is not the truth. So, so these things are there. These tools are there. We can use them to get some information. But if we rely only on this information, we have a big problem. <laughs> so I don't know, Francesca, if I answered your question. Uh, uh, I, let, me, let me try to uh, articulate a little bit more. 
because um, what you said is very, very true. But just in case it's useful, maybe we can kind of distinguish different sources of multiplicity. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There can be uh, issues with the data. Let's call it that. The data can certainly be non representative, it can have all sorts of biases and problems. Uh, it can have contaminations, it can have noise, it can have. So there is a source of non uniqueness in, in, in the conclusions that depends on the data per se. Okay. Um, in, in some kind of um, um, problematic, systematic way. Then there is a source of non uniqueness that comes from how the data is processed. Yeah. You know, can lead to very different conclusions. Uh, then there is a source of non uniqueness that can come from how the people yeah. that interpret the data read whatever has come yeah. out of the analysis. And of yeah. course, these things compound, it's not just one or the other. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, in, yeah. in the data science community, there is a lot of attention being put now to so-called stability of outputs from analysis, right? Yeah. Which essentially means, are you mm -hmm. sure that if you yeah. make some perturbations to the data or if you change the parameters of your algorithms a little bit, you are not yeah. producing a completely different result. So that's one yeah. layer, okay? Yeah. Of course, that the, the point that I was making is that sometimes even without the influencer, even without the biases, mm -hmm. even without yeah. all these things that may be typical of social uh, uh, um, media uh, data, signals are simply weak. Yeah. So the evidence for this or that conclusion is simply weak because the yeah. signals are weak. And, yeah. and this can happen. Even yeah. if the data is perfect, yeah. it can have weak signals within it. Yeah. Uh, but then on top of this, you know, there is the humans that draw conclusions. Yeah. And that's kind of a separate level of, of, of uh, potential multiplicity. So maybe it is of some use to sort of uh, identify potential sor sources of this uh, uh, non-uniqueness, because of course they, you yeah. address them in different ways. Right? Yeah. Whether it's biases in the data, whether yeah. it's the way the data is treated, whether it's just that the data has weak signals, whether it is that mm -hmm. the data is interpreted by humans that like to to find uh, okay. you know what they want to find in the output of an analysis. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Thing up now. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. I'm no, sorry. Thank you. I, I totally agree with you, Francesca. Really, one hundred percent. Good. I'm sorry to cut the discussion, but I think we have to move forward. And <laughs> bye bye. To say, and, no, and I, I think that Monica wanted to, to say something on this issue as well, but she is the next speaker, so she will let the floor in, in, in two seconds. I just wanted to stress that uh, what we are trying to, to do is to bridge the research we are doing with Ben Walker, with the research we are doing with uh, Selma Luli, because we, we are trying to think as well to uh, decision, core decisions, uh, not I mean, as long as it will be as tweets, but basically the idea is it's a, it's a, a mine of social information, uh, which of course can be biased. They, they only represent, if you want, a part of the pathologies, the pathologies in society, which are then discussed in courts. But I, we think that they could be very informative beyond uh, producing predictive models about the outcomes, but just giving uh, information about what is actually happening in society. So, uh, to to our understanding, uh, there are two two pieces of the same puzzle. Uh, but I will steal any more time, and I will give the floor to Professor Palmirani from University of Bologna. Thank you, Monica, for being here with us. And she uh, she is a, a clear representative of the of the multi hat. Because uh, of her very diverse uh, background uh, in uh, and, and and research interests that range from philosophy to informa informatics and 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 law, so Monica, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Giovanni. It's a great pleasure to be here in this workshop, and uh, my presentation is focused on. Uh, 
how prepare the data and the documents uh, for uh, the um, uh, application in artificial intelligence uh, and law. Uh, so, um, we are not in the scratch. Uh, we, we started uh, since uh, the NIT to elaborate and transform uh, in machine readable legislation case law and different uh, sources of law. And uh, we are not very happy in the community to talking about data, but the document uh, because document in legal domain is a, a complex uh, mix uh, of uh, ingredients. Uh, the structure itself Self is a knowledge, uh, the position of uh, some token and sentence in uh, such part of the document is uh, relevant, uh, is a uh, meaningful, and so we can extract data. But uh, usually we are managing text and document uh, uh, is a role uh, um, source. So in IT, we Publish the uh, law and the case law in uh, in the web using different standards. Uh, then we we have moved to open data in order to add the semantic uh, annotation. So the semantic meaning is uh, super important in the legal domain. And uh, now we are also using uh, the last decade was dedicated to use uh, these technology and discovery for uh, modeling since the beginning in natively uh, digital native uh, uh, format uh, the uh, legal document inside of the parliaments uh, or the courts. Uh, so our goal is to move uh, since the beginning the formalization in machine consumable in the authoritative uh, bodies uh, in in order to have authorial interpretation of the annotation by the uh, institutions. And uh, on the basis of these uh, valuable uh, sources, uh, we can develop uh, several applications uh, like legal analytics or artificial intelligence and also smart content because we have also emerging technology to formalize in an executable manner uh, the law and the case law and also the contract. So in the meantime, also artificial intelligence law uh, made a similar uh, evolution, starting from symbolic uh, artificial intelligence, logic programming, legal reasoning, argumentation, but also to add on the top of that semantic knowledge representation and now also machine learning and predictive. And uh, this is a very good text uh, uh, that I recommend to my students to read where there are some uh, um, classification taxonomy, how to use machine learning for e justice. We have a regression to correlate uh, different phenomena and to predict uh, future trends uh, or classification, very frequent used for classify uh, text uh, with very valuable part like arguments or uh, uh, obligation, right, the ontics part uh, of the text or to classify situation or person like a good citizen in such a situation uh, in the public administration. Another good use is it to, to use artificial intelligence for cluster documents and the case law, for instance, in order to discover if some uh, um, part of the legal system of judiciary system converge with um, some uh, opinion in the newspaper or in the society or to discover some association. Uh, we made some uh, experiment in the past to uh, discover the main topic in the social media and to see if these uh, uh, topic uh, are influencing the parliament agenda order of the day. And also, obviously, we use uh, artificial intelligence for control better the, um, the workflow and the uh, optimization of some situation like Twill and parliaments and Gazette. But uh, during our experiments, uh, because we conducted several experiments and projects, we uh, remark uh, some uh, weakness, or, or especially of machine learning in legal domain. Machine learning uh, uh, is based on token, sentence, uh, fragment of text, but as I explained it before, uh, we need also structures. So machine learning uh, works very well in the granularity, but uh, we need also to connect this granularity with the logic and with more knowledge and semantic. So to connect the speech 
speech, uh, the part of the speech uh, uh, together. Uh, an example is uh, I can detect an exception, but without the obligation, uh, the exception is nothing, and uh, the penalty without the duty and the obligation is uh, very limited. Another point that we are working with is to uh, include in machine learning more context. So, um, yes, and um, uh, more context uh, respect the temporal parameters of the law, of the case law, so not limited to the text as is, but also to put the text in the light of the jurisdiction, of the temporal parameters and other constraints. Also, the problem of the past and the future is very important in the legal domain. So, obviously, a new brilliant solution, especially in uh, case law, uh, is not predictable and uh, also a new event in the society. So, we need to find the modelization that uh, put in, in balance uh, the past the best experiences uh, with the new one that even if are very limited uh, in the scarcity of data. And those are the two important things are connected with the uh, citation. Citation in legal domain is a very relevant methodology to uh, point out uh, external content, external document fragments. And internal, external um, citation are so relevant. So when I find uh, Article 3, the machine uh, is not capable to understand uh, the greater distance uh, is in, with uh, Article 13, but obviously they're talking about uh, very different topics. So in our projects, uh, we recall fragment of the citation and we embed it inside of the uh, model in order to uh, analyze uh, the fragment of the citation and to provide context. And finally, the static link uh, uh, produces uh, an information, obviously, but uh, the law is dynamic. So the Article 3 in a given moment talking about a completely different thing in another temporal moment. So we need also to put on the top a temporal model uh, that taking consideration the evolution over time. So this is uh, what we are now working in our project uh, and uh, what we uh, are now including in our architecture using, uh, um, I don't know why, uh, yes, okay. So this is some examples. So um, taking consideration European citizen concept, for instance, of definition. Obviously with the Brexit and now the, the concept is totally different. Or if you take in consideration the last uh, decades of uh, accession of new countries inside of the member states uh, uh, of the European uh, uh, land. So the definition change uh, meaning during the time. So it's so relevant to take in consideration in machine learning or in general artificial intelligence techniques, also the temporal view and the legal theory point of view, because we have a three axes, uh, entering force of law, uh, entering operational and application, when exactly the law is applicable in uh, to the concrete case. Also institution view is uh, so important, political decision uh, can influence a lot. Uh, uh, the, the, the predictive, uh, and so we need to have a model quite flexible to include also political uh, parameters and also values, values coming from a European tradition or, or a US tradition and so forth. Uh, time to time, we have also the impression that the predictive is a black box and from the document to the new representation of the output. So in our uh, experience, uh, we are using uh, uh, legal XML standards uh, like Acomantoso and the legal RuleML that are OAC standards, international standards used uh, in uh, many countries. Uh, the European institutions are adopted Acomantoso as official standard also also UN and US and uh, New Zealand uh, uh, declared the legal ML 
the standard for codifying the law in the uh, official cabinet. So we believe that the mix of two artificial intelligence techniques uh, on the top of uh, standardization of the semantic uh, knowledge and also the structured document knowledge is very a good uh, uh, methodology. And um, obviously, we are, uh, have in mind also the possibility using the standards uh, to uh, have also uh, the possibility to uh, um, explain the output of the artificial intelligence uh, elaboration. And this is our architecture. So we start from the text. We use a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, techniques for extract knowledge, uh, machine learning, but also natural language processing, a part of the speech, uh, and identity recognition, and uh, go back with the inputs uh, and confirmation by the legal expert. So uh, we're talking about supervised uh, uh, machine learning. We arrive to a good standard uh, uh, test in XML with a lot of knowledge uh, um, using also semantic web. Then we try to help the legal expert to formalize in logic. So we use also symbolic artificial intelligence and, and the legal reasoning and to formalize in legal ulamel. Legal ulamel permits multiple alternatives, uh, uh, equally legal valid because of the same piece of rule of norms that could be interpreted in different manner in different jurisdiction, like in Italian level or European level or regional level. And all these interpretations are equally valid. So legal ulamel permits uh, to annotate uh, the same piece of norm with the different uh, parameters and different uh, interpretation. And then when we are super sure that everything is uh, consistent and checked uh, with the uh, uh, engine, we can use uh, with the other artificial intelligence application or to serialize for the smart contract. And finally, we will want also to give an explanation to the end user uh, about all the process and to implement uh, the explicability principle using legal design paradigm. Our methodology is integrated with the uh, human computer interaction principles uh, based on uh, user centered methodology. So we analyze uh, the user persona and uh, we have uh, the principle of human in the loop in any moments uh, for uh, permitting a um, confirmation of the serialization. And these are some of our output of, of the projects. The first one is a criminal code of Italy, and uh, using a comment also, we can predict the next modification, potential next article that can produce a modification in the next future because I'm not perfectly <laughs> good or because uh, uh, are some integration with other norms uh, that uh, are modifying. The second graph is a clustering uh, um, annotation uh, and uh, using several parameters concerning the ordinance of Emilia Romagna during the, uh, the last uh, earthquake. So we can discover that uh, some cluster are very close and similar together concerning some parameters, but other are isolated. And this isolation is not good, obviously, because uh, isolation in the legal system means uh, our high level norms and principle, constitutional level, but it's not the case. We are in the ordinance level, secondary law. And so this isolated means only one thing that are wrong. And so we can discover why we, we have so many isolated ordinance and which mistakes uh, we can avoid in the next future when will be a new earthquake. And the third uh, an analysis uh, was done uh, a correlation between a constitutional court and, and primary law and modification of the primary law connected and correlated with the constitutional uh, decision. And how much the constitutional decision uh, affected the, the law and modified the law over time? And what is the perspective? 
And these are another visualization of our analysis using uh, k-means uh, clustering, and we can uh, use these with the European current of human rights, and we can discover isolated group, and uh, we can uh, the, the legal expert can analyze why we have these uh, so isolated uh, uh, group uh, respect the others. And also we can calculate uh, similar bills in order to discover that different parties declared uh, to have different opinions, but is not <laughs> at the end. And so to make um, transparent the parliament process for the citizen. And also correlation between, as I said before, the constitutional court and the legislation. In, in 2019, we won a challenge launched by the United Nations, and we serialized in a commentos of all the resolution of New, New York General Assembly, and also we annotate these uh, uh, for uh, with uh, machine learning, uh, especially using the ontology of uh, sustainable development goals in order to detect uh, which decisions uh, are taken and address it to whom and in which period of time, and if the same decision is repeated and why. Why we have several decisions equally <laughs> declared in different period, historical period, and what is the trend of the next uh, resolution? And now we are working on the court, constitutional court decision uh, in Italian, uh, already serialized in uh, Comandoso. These are our portal uh, open. Uh, is an open source, so everybody can download the data set. And now we are correlating the constitutional court decision with the legislation at the regional level and the national level in order to discover the impact of the constitutional court of Italy on the legislation of the parliament. And secondly, if there are some correlation with the new rights emerging in the legislation coming from uh, the first uh, time in the constitutional court decision. So now everything is included in a large project called IE for Justice, funded by the Emilia Romagna region. And uh, I'm very happy to share with you uh, the preliminary output and also for the future, because I think uh, the challenge is very high and uh, all the competencies uh, should be on board for uh, performing some uh, relevant findings. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Monica, for this very, very informative and challenging um, um, presentation. Uh, I just want to stress a couple of, uh, of, of points. I think there are some uh, red threads that are uniting as we uh, opt and anticipated the various uh, interventions so far. Uh, one is the relevance in, uh, in legal text of time, which is uh, it's, it's peculiar because it leads to different semantics over time, even uh, and often with the same legal text. So the, the, the temporal dimension, as has been stressed, it's, it's a key specificity, if you want, of, of, of legal mining. Okay. A second red thread that I think is already very clearly emerging is the needed interplay between the extraction, not just of words, but arguments to tie them with the legal theories behind um, each, each element. And a third um, one, it's uh, uh, bringing all this uh, together uh, by basically uh, putting forward the idea that there may be more than one right solution, not only over time, but different legal answers can be equally valid although they are different to the same questions, which is a social question, which is something that normally we as a jurist are not able to illustrate uh, outside our borders because the normal usual reaction is not possible I and mean, you should have one law, which is not actually always the case uh, for a number of reasons for justice of the, the specific case, because the law is slowly evolving uh, with different parameters, 
So uh, this is definitely very well illustrating all the complexity of dealing with legal text in developing uh, AI based in the meaning of the proposed uh, regulation, as I'm sure Denise will uh, uh, will uh, illustrate. Funny. But, uh, is yeah. space as important as time or not? Yeah. Space, space um, okay. uh, is jurisdiction. It's not a space. Yeah. There is a concept of jurisdiction. UN is not a space. <laughs> it's a jurisdiction. UN, but also EU. And uh, we have ma many other example of jurisdiction like taxation is a jurisdiction that uh, some rules are interpreted in different manner in jurisdiction of taxation law tax law or uh, international law okay. uh, can i can add also some another example very clear in my opinion but i don't know uh, how, how it is important the, uh, nowadays uh, there are a lot of uh, very relevant uh, uh, studies in machine learning or predictive uh, artificial intelligence in e-justice but um, no, nobody are including uh, now temporal checking in this sense. Um, why all the case law are equally uh, managed inside of the uh, sources if uh, some case law are based on very old fashioned law not uh, or now in force or repealed uh, by others so we need first of all to annotate semantically which uh, case law are valid or based on in the argumentation of the judge of the valid nowadays and enforce and applicable law and which one are good example for the past but not uh, based on legally speaking of current uh, updated law and uh, nowadays uh, I, I see research that uh, manage uh, these uh, sources in an equal manner it's crazy, in my opinion, because obviously the case law based on the old fashioned law should be a different weight and different parameters respect to which one are still valid based on the current law. And uh, this is, from my opinion, a great difference between the common law and the civil law. And also this is another important uh, um, element to take in consideration. Yeah, if I may add, add on that and react after to what Francesca was asking about space. I mean, on uh, uh, from, from what you said, Monica, I mean, uh, we, we need to aim to more fine tuning tools than the Shepard citator evolved in LexisNexis and West law, because, for instance, uh, case law federal, at least, but main, main most state law as well in the US, it's actually analyzed without the use of machine machine learning and, and artificial intelligence exactly in the historical approach given weight to precedents in that way and it has been done manually for about a century already and uh, almost a half a century in an automated way by databases like lexis uh, nexus and west law so i think what we have to look forward in this direction, it's uh, uh, something that gives us in city law countries where we don't normally have those tools, but in other jurisdictions in common law don't have them either. Uh, some tools that enable us to give different weight. And this moves back to the, the introductory remarks made uh, by um, Van Walker, because basically, this is a way of understanding what are the arguments and their weight. That's why we are looking to extract arguments more than words. And going back to a space, as Francesca was saying, uh, I think that space matters very much, even beyond jurisdiction. Because jurisdiction somehow is a overlap because a court has jurisdiction over the territory. So in that sense, it's space. But space according to different topic as also a huge relevance uh, beyond the jurisdiction. Just a very simple example is, for instance, in and this is one of the uh, of the uh, the bad test we are using in predictive justice, for instance, uh, the place of where the the plaintiff is living, for instance, has been highly significant highly debated, highly debatable as well, 
uh, for awarding damages. So one element that comes out from space, for instance, is the different level of uh, quantifying the damages according to different places, not only in time. So where people reside, where people live. Okay, so that's just one element. One other element that uh, uh, we are trying to figure out is this intersection between policy extractions from uh, uh, decisions, judicial decisions, and argument extractions from the uh, judicial decisions. It's trying to understand, for instance, where place matter for a decision. So whether or not some services are uh, present or not can somehow lead, as a matter of fact, a, a court to decide a legal element in one direction or another. So whether or not, for instance, uh, there are social services that enable both parents to take care of the same way uh, to their kids to decide and wait whether or not to allocate a shared, more or less shared responsibility in taking care of the kids. That's one one clear example we, we thought uh, about that we are uh, willing to test. So space matter very much beyond jurisdiction. But all that definitely matters, and that's uh, the baseline, not the red threat. It's how algorithms are built and how algorithm works. And that's basically the the playing field of Professor Faragina. So I'm uh, very happy to give the floor to uh, our colleague, Paolo Faragina, who is uh, an authority in building algorithms uh, internationally. And uh, thank you, Paolo, for, for being with us. You have the floor. Thanks very much for the invitation. So uh, just uh, uh, to make clear, I, I never worked on legal documents. So I'm, I'm working on algorithms for search engines, for web search engines. Uh, we need to uh, change that, Paolo. Sorry? We, we need, need to, to change that. Yeah. So, uh, in, so I think that uh, um, Giovanni invited me just to, to say something about what are the new frontiers in web search. And uh, I took inspiration actually from the, um, from the talk of the speech of uh, Professor Walker and uh, the last one by Professor Palmirani. So I, I tried to share because I never used the WebEx. So let's see. So let's go to this. Can you see the slide? Uh, yes, actually, it's Ben Walker's slide. Yes. So during the talk of uh, Professor Walker, I copied this slide, and I think that uh, there could be some some touch uh, on this uh, context uh, issue because uh, what I will talk about uh, is related to extraction of context, uh, but of course not in legal documents, but in classic text documents. And the second one is this slide from Professor Palmirani, because I, I was in some sense captured by these uh, uh, statements about semantically connected uh, entities in text. And I will also say something about this. So I'm not saying that what I will say is useful for legal documents, but I just try to, to let you know something about, uh, as I said, web search and what uh, Google and the others are doing in classic documents that I think would be helpful for legal documents too. So let me start from text understanding. So uh, it's, I, I wrote that it's easy for humans, but of course you would say that it depends on the humans. But anyway, let's assume that it's easy for humans uh, and uh, for sure it's hard for machines. Uh, and what the companies and academia try to do in the last years is uh, try to simulate what humans are doing when they try to understand text. And so essentially what happens in your mind when you try to understand text is good to connect the pieces of text to what you know. So what is your knowledge in some sense? And to find entities that allow you to understand the content of the text. So this idea, this rough idea, abstract idea was in some sense formalized by Google in 2012. So now it's 10 years that introduced what is called the knowledge graph. I don't know how many of you know about the knowledge graph, just uh, very briefly, it's a graph. So it's uh, a set of nodes. Uh, here are depicted like uh, circles and every circle represents an entity. The entity can be, a, let's say, a human, um, an important person, or maybe an event, or maybe let's say a city. 
So every maybe also something that occurred in the past. So anything that is in some sense important. And uh, among these entities, so the name is entity, uh, among these entities, you have edges, so these connections. And the connections have different colors because they have different types. And uh, actually, in the Google Graph, uh, people say it's not, obviously, it's not an official, uh, let's say, information, but say that they contain billions of nodes and uh, several billion edges. And they have about uh, 1,000 and more types of connections. Okay, so a connection may be a friendship, maybe someone leaded in, uh, or let's say participated, or it's uh, a province, and so on. So, uh, why these knowledge graphs are important? Because uh, Professor Palmirani talked about uh, natural uh, language processing, which actually is a, a, a tool in. Uh, in um, artificial intelligence that actually identifies entities so and allows to associate to these entities some types so it's a noun it's a verb uh, it's a person uh, here what i want to do is just to make a, a step beyond and this is what uh, uh, the knowledge graph did so just to explain the idea i took this phrase leonardo the scientist who painted mona lisa and what algorithms do is actually that they identify pieces of text. Here I consider Leonardo and Mona Lisa, and they disambiguate this, uh, uh, let's say, this text, Leonardo, by linking it uh, to a node, so an entity. In this case, the entity was Leonardo da Vinci. Of course, uh, since I did the slide, this is correct, but obviously these algorithms are not uh, always correct. And Mona Lisa is linked to this entity. Now, what is the, the reason to do this? Because behind these entities, there is a graph. So since there is a graph, you know from the entity that Leonardo da Vinci is related to science, is related to cartography, to Italy, and so on. Also for Mona Lisa, you have the Louvre, Renaissance, Florence. And so you, are, you have links to other nodes in the graph. The graph may be small or huge, depends on your knowledge graph. And given this, you can do abstraction, you can do semantic relations, and so on. So this is a very powerful way to not only disambiguate the text, but also put the text in relation to other uh, entities. And um, so if you search for surrealism, then you could find this phrase as a possible answer, even if surrealism does not exist as a term in this text. So the idea is to go from a level which is purely syntactic to a level which is in some sense a semantic. And when we say semantic search nowadays, we actually mean this one, that we map a text to nodes in graphs. And uh, this is very important because actually we are moving the complexity of uh, let's say reasoning or semantic annotation to the complexity of building these, these graphs. And parts of these graphs are built manually, and most of the time you have to find algorithms that build the graph, and the graph are robust. Actually, I can tell you that one of the problems of fake news is the fact that Google and the others are building these graphs starting from news, for example, to find the new entities. And of course, if you have a fake news, you create links here that are fake links. So all the argument and reasoning could be wrong. Okay. So, okay, we started to work on this problem more than 10 years ago. So before that, actually, Google were out on, uh, on, this, um, on the knowledge graph because it was a very interesting problem uh, algorithmically since uh, we want to do this annotation on the fly, so in milliseconds, and this is a very crucial algorithmic problem. So why this is important? This is important because what you can do is actually that when you have a phrase, you can annotate this phrase. For example, you can take uh, these pieces of text and map to the Wikipedia pages. Ah, by the way, uh, as academia, we are using Wikipedia as a knowledge graph. Okay, and so we can map to these uh, notes in the wiki in Wikipedia, so that whenever another phrase arrives or another piece of text, you do the same entity linking. Uh, what is, this is the name. So you find the page of the president of the United States or Ultimatum or Libya. And what you do is that even if these two phrases are totally syntactically different, since you have these pages, also the pages are totally different. But uh, if you immerse the pages in the graph, you will surely find links between, for example, this page and this page, and between Barack Obama and the President of the United States, 
or even if you don't have a direct link, you have paths among the nodes. So the clear algorithmic problem for us is to make these computations very, very fast. Okay. And we actually apply this technology to clustering, to classification, to sentence similarity, to keyword restructuring, and so on. Just to give you an idea, we started to work with Google in the round 2000, 2010, before the knowledge graph was out. So we applied it to classic text. So as I said, I never applied this to legal documents. Uh, and we released the tool that I will mention, which is called the TagMe. Then uh, we moved with Google to entity linking in queries, which is a very complicated problem because the query, the queries of users are very short. So you have only two or three terms and you want to understand what the user actually wants from uh, the, the query. Then uh, we actually moved to uh, economic documents. So we had a collaboration with Bloomberg and we wanted to check uh, in news. So news and tweets which kind of entities were present. And so a sort of more refined in terms of granularity classification. And uh, then we move to another um, scenario, which is in my opinion, very interesting, how to find experts. So if you have papers from, uh, in, uh, from professors, for example, and you are searching for someone which is expert in a topic, what, how these things can help you. And so we have a tool that actually is used within the University of Pisa and allows you to find professors which are experts in some topics. And this is called Wiser. And finally, we are working on bio networks in the, in the Soviet Data Plus Plus Now project uh, and Human AI. And so we have a, a, a way, we are building knowledge graphs on biology because whenever we have knowledge graph, we have all the other machinery that we have uh, developed in the past. Just to give you an idea, and this is just to make some advertising on our so big data uh, platform. Uh, we, we have all these tools that are openly, and so they are publicly available. So we have Tagme, which is the entity linker. We have Watt, which is a refined tool that actually was coming, was some sense developed after Tagme, and we have other stuff. And uh, so, as you see, uh, I, I cannot say anything about legal documents, but I just wanted to put on the floor and the, the table this kind of technology that possibly can be useful also in the legal scenario. Giovanni. Thank you very much, Paolo. Also, because I, I'm, uh, I'm sure that some of these tools can be uh, used. Actually, we tried to evolve and move from the idea of tag in an experiment that we ran with uh, Cristina Amato and, uh, and, and, and a spin off with one of your uh, PhD um, students. So I do know that those tools can be leveraged for sure in legal text because we experimented <laughs> directly on, 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 on that. Uh, thank you very much for this very uh, Thanks for the invitation again. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's that's great. And uh, uh, we've been basically very often referring to criminal cases uh, in uh, and uh, I mean some of the quotation from Monica and 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 so on and so forth. So we are be basically have been opening the floor for the next uh, uh, couple of speakers. I think um, Professor Morgante will be uh, the the only speaker because Francesca is moving. Uh, Francesca Romano is moving on a train, so <laughs> she might have problems connecting. And uh, uh, what they did was applying to some cases on corruption, if I'm not recalling wrong, and uh, with a nice results. But I want to steal the floor to uh, Professor Morgante, but I just give it to you. Microphone. Apri il microfono, Gaetana, perché è spento. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, as Obama in Wikipedia would say, yes. <laughs> and uh, can you confirm me you see my presentation? Okay, okay, thank you so much, Giovanni. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself again. I'm not a data scientist or um, a statistic expert. I'm a criminal lawyer. And I uh, would like to present you the main lines of this uh, uh, research I conducted with uh, 
uh, some colleagues of the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna, namely the uh, already mentioned professor uh, Francesca Romano of the uh, Institute of Economics and of the uh, Department of Excellence and Beds, and uh, some other experts of uh, ISTAT, the uh, Italian National Statistics Institute. Uh, my presentation concerns uh, the use of uh, text mining techniques and case law in describing and measuring corruption. This is the brief agenda of my uh, presentation of today. I uh, we'll start from uh, the uh, beginning of the research, uh, the research question, uh, the interdisciplinary methodology of the research, the outputs of it, and uh, the future challenges. Um, the starting point of the research was how to measure and investigate the corruption phenomenon beyond the, um, the uh, famous uh, uh, Transparency International uh, Corruption Perception Index, um, an index that is not based uh, on the real dimension of the crime, but on the uh, subjective perception. And the uh, challenge was uh, uh, to uh, overcome the question of the so-called dark figure of uh, corruption, because uh, uh, corruption is a sort of, uh, um, of crime affected by a uh, dark figure because uh, the emerged uh, corruption uh, is, uh, uh, is not the, really, the, uh, the, the, the real dimension of the real crime that is uh, mainly hidden. So the uh, challenge was to go beyond the corruption perception index in describing and measuring corruption and the, uh, the main available uh, objective uh, indicator was the judiciary indicator. Uh, the um, uh, objective judiciary indicator takes uh, into account only the emerged corruption. So this is uh, an objective uh, indicator, but not realistic uh, um, uh, indicator because uh, um, it uh, doesn't measure the hidden corruption. So the research question was how to extract from the only available official sources, the uh, criminal judgments, helpful information, but for a qualitative and quantitative characterization of the corruption phenomenon and for elaborating objective indicators uh, in terms of uh, geographical description of the corruption or functional description of corruption to implement, as we will see at the end of this brief, uh, of this, uh, brief presentation, to implement counter strategies and conduct scientific research on uh, more uh, broadly uh, criminal economy. Uh, the methodology was uh, really interdisciplinary because uh, um, computational linguistics expressed the interest in the texts of the judgments favoring the uh, extraction of uh, the addressed topics, namely the information on uh, corruption, implementing research lines to describe um, criminal phenomena, predicting uh, judicial outcomes, uh, starting from the facts set out in the judgments. And it's interesting to point out, uh, I think, uh, in, this, uh, um, in this workshop that we analyze not only judgments expressly related to corruption, but also 
judgment related to a um, uh, broader context, uh, uh, namely uh, judgments uh, uh, concerning uh, corporation in relation with the public administrations, uh, with uh, uh, crime of uh, misappropriation of uh, public funds, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, research not only on the crime of corruption, um, uh, uh, provided and uh, punished by a criminal code, uh, but on the broader uh, phenomenon of uh, corruption. And for this reason, uh, we uh, used uh, the, uh, the, 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 the research conducted by um, uh, predictive justice uh, and also the, uh, the outcomes of the research of Giovanni uh, to uh, analyze uh, these, uh, uh, these judgments uh, using uh, uh, advanced uh, techniques uh, for analyzing legal text. And uh, for this reason, the uh, mainly criminal judgments uh, we analyzed um, uh, can be used uh, as uh, a source of data, a very important and significant source of data for describing and measuring corruption beyond the limits of the corruption perception index, only subjective, as I said before, and the limits of a uh, very, uh, very uh, strict and rigid uh, objective indicators uh, only based on uh, criminal judgments on the crime of corruption. And uh, the use of these methods uh, and uh, tools of the lexical textual analysis on the criminal judgments was very useful to identify corruption dimension over the years and the, uh, the uh, territorial diffusion of, uh, of the crime. Um, the research group of the criminal economy led by Professor Guido Rey and the Professor Francesca Romano also explored the possibility of extracting from criminal judgments very important information for example, financial information uh, in terms of uh, amounts in euros uh, of, uh, of uh, um, uh, illegal payments uh, performed to public officials from private companies uh, and the, um, the uh, decisions we uh, mainly analyzed uh, was the uh, decisions uh, of uh, um, a criminal courts of cassation. Italian criminal courts of cassation. And starting from the textual analysis of the judgments, uh, we, um, we tried to identify the relevant, the, the, the relevant elements uh, uh, present in the judgments uh, or extractable from the judgments uh, to, um, uh, to uh, transform the information coming from the judgments uh, in a statistical data and to connect this data coming from the judgments analysis with other data from different database. Um, uh, uh, this uh, methodology uh, was justified by the issue that uh, judgments, uh, um, uh, above all criminal judgments, are not written for statistical purposes. And therefore, it's necessary to outline a methodology able to transform it into statistical analyzable data. And the uh, results obtained uh, through the statistical textual analysis uh, of uh, judicial documents, thanks to the software TALTAC uh, of the uh, Department of Excellence and BEDS, integrated with uh, numerical data or other sources of, uh, of uh, information, uh, makes it possible the design of a database on the uh, measuring and uh, 
description of corruption phenomenon with uh, statistical characteristics, uh, namely reliability, completeness, and updating. Uh, these uh, um, these uh, uh, statistical analyses uh, um, uh, can be also linked with other statistical database uh, in uh, a sort of circle moving from criminal judgments to text mining to the linkage with different database to uh, the creation of statistical data and let me say uh, the uh, final output of the challenge to give to reach a, a realistic rendering uh, of the corruption phenomenon beyond the limits of the corruption perception index uh, and uh, of the only objective judicial uh, indicator. Um, uh, this was uh, briefly the infographic I would like to present you to give you a sort of overview of the research uh, we analyzed um, the uh, presence in uh, in the judgments of uh, uh, express uh, uh, mention to uh, natural or uh, uh, corporation juridical person uh, we uh, we searched uh, uh, for uh, the uh, financial impact uh, of uh, these uh, uh, criminal activities uh, and the characteristic of the criminal event, uh, the uh, place uh, of the criminal event in terms of the geographical distribution uh, of the corruption phenomenon, mainly in, uh, in Italy. And very, very interesting was for us to uh, extract and study and analyze uh, from the criminal judgments uh, also the relation um, um, uh, between the private corporations involved in the criminal activities and the criminal association or public institutions or other private companies. Um, this is a very brief infographic on the methodology. So the uh, moving from the judgments, uh, the text mining analysis, uh, the linkage with other database, the creation of statistical database and statistical analysis on the uh, uh, corruption phenomenon. Um, and these uh, these uh, these activities were um, uh, are uh, performed to um, to um, to get a picture of uh, uh, corruption phenomenon in terms of the impact of the crime on the activities of uh, public administrations on the geographical distribution in. Uh, uh, in Italy of uh, uh, corruption phenomenon that is a very geopardized distribution uh, information on the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the type of the corporation business mainly affected by, uh, by uh, corruption activities, uh, information on the um, public sectors mainly involved, for example, public procurement procedures or the health circle uh, mainly in this uh, uh, in this uh, emergency um, emergency moment the economic dimension as i said before and uh, the uh, analysis was also very useful in order to validate explanatory models of the corruption phenomenon proposed in the literature with complete data from the judgment. Let me only um, uh, present you some of the um, the uh, future challenges of uh, uh, of the research 
uh, that uh, could be uh, in future useful uh, to uh, upgrade uh, uh, criminology studies uh, on uh, uh, corruption phenomenon uh, to implement uh, evidence-based uh, investigations, uh, law enforcement, uh, judicial cooperation, uh, especially in the field of the so-called systemic corruption, also mentioned by our DNA uh, as a, a um, high-level risk in a pandemic emergency and uh, evidence-based criminal policy and let me say also legislative advocacy the uh, problem of the problem today is the question uh, of the so-called smart compliance and smart controls uh, in public procurement procedures uh, especially dealing with the delivery of goods and services uh, um, to overcome the pandemic emergency. So the main idea is to use the outputs of this, uh, this research to, um, to implement more and more uh, a sort of tech-driven crime prevention that is the main challenge of the fight against the, uh, the systemic uh, corruption. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm very uh, grateful to uh, Giovanni to, um, to involve me in this, uh, in, this, uh, um, in this panel, and uh, I'm available for questions or information or curiosity. Thank you very much, Gaetana. We don't only share, we, we share many things, including being Sicilians, both of us, but uh, definitely we share also, as I think our last panelist will, uh, will, uh, will illustrate the, 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 uh, the fact that we, from April 21st of this year, we tend to be uh, somehow illegal in our research. Because uh, the the predictive policing towards you were uh, and and Francesca Romano are uh, aiming with the, with the tools we are all building in embeds uh, are somehow uh, seen with the um, high level of suspicion <laughs> by the proposed AI uh, AI act. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, we are we are at only twenty minutes, so I suggest we move directly to the next uh, uh, two speakers so that we have uh, eventually some overtime for 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 questions and and and, and discussion so uh i am it's my uh, pleasure to give the floor to dr Likari, who is our uh, chief data scientist in uh, in in many of our research uh projects and especially in predictive justice that uh, he is uh, bravely presenting thank you daniela hello everyone can you see my screen yes or no Okay. Yes. yes. So uh, today I introduce you the predictive justice platform that uh, is uh, one of the main objects of the predictive justice project, and uh, I will discuss to the direction we are going. The project is based on the work of the professor uh, Walker. Uh, he is one of the people of this. Uh, project and actually we developed and spent his work for the Italian legal context. So the platform uh, automatically transformed the common law case uh, collection into a semantically annotated database and uh, uh, extract the book oh, and extract the personal identifiable information from them. The annotation are related uh, to the sentence type, uh, like finding evidence, legal rule, reasoning based on the evidence, uh, reasoning based on the legal rule. Finally, the anonymized annotated data set can be explored by uh, sentence type and uh, semantic similarity using a, a search engine. This is a very powerful tool for understanding the legal litigation and the related logical process. Uh, so, uh, and uh, also, despite in um, in European community there has been talk uh, of legal document standardization for years, the Italian civil law 
is a mess. There is no standard template, no standard structure, no standard style, uh, style rules. So the description of the legal case not linear and don't contain facts, reasoning, and decision in this, uh, this order. So you can find the sentence about decision at the beginning, at the beginning of the document or in the middle or at the end. And uh, this is the same for other sentence type. So without, uh, uh, without any automatic uh, annotation uh, and search system, uh, it's not easy to find relevant information from this uh, mess. For uh, the, the platform can be used uh, for different uh, uh, purposes. For example, a judge can evaluate a litigation of, a, of uh, litig evaluate litigation related to the overlapping legal issue uh, based on the similarity of legal rules or evidence verification and so on. Expert or no expert can assess the discrepancy between legal rule and the reasoning behind the legal rule, the evidence and the reasoning behind the evidence. And uh, lawyer, for example, can compare a relevant point uh, of a case uh, um, with uh, uh, the previous litigation for a better argumentation. So, um, in, in order to annotate the raw text, uh, we convert the, the PDF file and the legal document metadata, legal document metadata, into a flexible legal semantic JSON data format that is format is proposed by. Professor Walk and Steve Strong. And uh, it can capture all aspects uh, of the legal document and uh, uh, can, uh, you can add uh, uh, annotation, entity, and so on. Uh, finally, it can be easy converting into other makeup language, for example, a uh, command So the first fundamental step in a uh, Data science project is the data annotation. So we created the high quality annotated data, data set by writing the annotation protocol. And the annotation protocol describes the meaning of the labels, uh, the linguistic and the law context uh, which they occur. In this way, the expert can have the predetermined reference in order to avoid the arbitrariness. Uh, we use also a consensus algorithm uh, for agreement of a single data point uh, among multiple individuals. So each sentence is evaluated by three experts and we apply a majority vote for the choice of the final label. We reduce the, also the labeling errors by creating a web in application for annotation so the expert can easily choose the right label. So the first the first task we are carrying out concerns the sentence classification for this type of sentence. We select a small representative sample of legal documents to be annotated and used to train our model. We are trying all possible pre-training models for Italian language like BERT, Umberto, Electra, and so on, and different pre-processing techniques, for example, expanding the abbreviation or the spelling correction. In addition, we are going to train one from scratch using only legal documents. We started with the personal injury damage and the family law of the court of Genoa and soon they go also uh, in the court of PISA, but uh, we can extend to other legal sector as well. So the second task we are going on concern the pseudonymization and the entity extraction. Uh, so we want to identify predefined entities uh, present in the text, such as a person name, date, company, unique identifier, location, and, uh, uh, co uh, and uh, 
In this way, we can easily find and replace them by removing personally identifiable information from the text. We are uh, using three approach to, to do this. Uh, a rule-based uh, uh, approach, for example, river description, deep learning-based linear model, and a hybrid approach uh, combining the, the two parts approach. So the platform includes a collaborative environment for data model for data labeling uh, where a user can exchange comments, uh, so not on the specific, specific case law or a part of text. And a user can use tags to report bugs or for attribution on the sentence. Uh, just to clarify, for example, the user can write this is a, uh, this is a finding sentence because uh, it said that the judge sentenced Daniele to pay one dollar, and in this case, sentence uh, is uh, the word sentence is a lexical Q, and a lexical Q are um, Q are uh, linguistic expression a word a multi word that can signal the presence, the presence of the specific class. In this case, the presence of the uh, finding class. In addition, we can compare the lexical Q with the AI lexical Q using uh, the uh, attribution based on the AI explanation method uh, like line sharp, sharp to find the most important words for this prediction of a specific class. So, for example, we can compare the word relevant for the human and with the word relevant for the, the AI model. Uh, just um, an example, in this case, the sentence, the, 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 the first sentence, the judge sentences Daniele to pay a fine of one euro, the model predicts finding, uh, because uh, uh, the sentence contains the word sentence. In the second sample, uh, the model predicts verification because uh, uh, the sentence contains um, obvious uh, disparity. In conclusion, take into account uh, the obvious disparity in income and the obvious disparity for uh, the model is important for the verification class. And the other sample for the model, she demonstrated to have made the extensive effort for his lexical queue. So the word are word important for the reasoning based on the evidence. And the income for employment is a war is a lexical too important for the evidence class. So this is just an example. But in this way, we can improve the annotation protocol, uh, finding new lexical cues and evaluate the annotation uh, errors by the expert and finally increase the quality of the annotated. Uh, data set and then uh, the performance of our models. And now uh, this is the, the big picture, the big picture, sorry. And uh, uh, in red dashed rectangle, you can see um, the PJ platform. Each uh, module inside uh, the small blue uh, dashed uh, rectangle correspond to a, a specific sub project. So the, the ETL uh, stand for extract, transform, uh, load module, convert uh, the raw data to the uh, JSON data, so legal semantic uh, JSON data, and uh, it can attach an anonymized version by interacting with the data anonymization model. The data lake is a centralized uh, repository for handling uh, data, reproducibility, uh, reproducibility, tracking of data experiment, and uh, user can annotate his uh, uh, data, his LSJSON data, using the web app for uh, data annotation. 
um, in order to um, train the model uh, for uh, automatic annotation sentence type. All anonymized and uh, annotated data uh, can be explored by the search engine that uh, allow user uh, a full text semantic query on different sentence type uh, and metadata. In this the, 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 this is the, the, the first phase of the project. In the second phase, uh, maybe in the next year, we want to use this platform to analyze the legal case on the specific subject by implementing predictive model on the outcome of the legal case in order to reconstruct uh, uh, and explain the underlying legal reasoning. Just for example, in, uh, I already said to you that this platform can be, used, can be useful for judge, for uh, lawyer, for expert, and um, to analyze the judicial system, but uh, it can foster more advanced analysis on the legal decision. Uh, here an example, we can use uh, uh, this platform in the second phase uh, 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 to extract the variable, the, pre the variable to predict uh, easily from the decision sentence, the finding sentence. We can extract, for, in this, for example, uh, accepted, rejected, uh, the child support uh, money uh, in uh, family law depend of, uh, uh, of the, on the specific subject or not. And uh, you, we can, uh, uh, if you want training a model on decision, you should exclude the decision sentence from the training uh, uh, process. We want to, to uh, find only the ex-ante data to train the model. Finally, we can compare the reasoning of the model uh, with the reason with the judge, uh, we can do a lot of uh, things with this uh, plat uh, platform, but maybe my time is up. This is just to few words. Uh, this, uh, in our case, the ex ante information is information before the judge's uh, reasoning. And uh, the use of the uh, of this platform uh, is really important to create a predictive model on the decision and uh, to filter out uh, all ex post um, data from the training set. Okay, mm, this is uh, uh, just a mock up of what we can do. We can uh, uh, train the model uh, for the specific. Uh, uh, specific analysis. In this case, for example, uh, we suppose that uh, thanks to the predicting just platform, we have trained a very good model for uh, um, predict if uh, a request is rejected or not. Uh, we can uh, use this platform uh, for uh, compare legal case with similar semantic, uh, similar evidence. Sorry. And we can see the model prediction and also the, the most important concept uh, explained by the, the, the model that the, the judge or the user should be pay attention for each case uh, and can influence the, the, the target variable. In this case, uh, is the decision accepted or the rejected. We can compare uh, the, the AI reasoning. Uh, Sorry for uh, AI reasoning. I know it's an inappropriate term, but I use it for uh, syntactic sugar just to provide a clear idea. But we can compare this, the, the model reasoning uh, with the uh, JAD, JAD reasoning. And uh, uh, we can, say we can uh, uh, check if uh, there is a discrepancy. Uh, if, mm, so, just to understand if why the model is wrong and if the model is wrong for that specific case law, this is, it can be uh, interesting. So just uh, uh, I finished the here the highly motivated machine learning teams that uh, we want to innovate the legal sector 
and we believe that the predictive justice platform is the first uh, step in this direction. So thank you uh, for all of your attention I'm, and uh, your all suggestions. Comments. Thank you very much, Daniela. It was a really a thorough presentation of all our work and our perspectives. So it's uh, very, very, very informative. And I, I give immediately the floor to uh, our colleague Denise Amram, uh, which is literally closing our our discussion with the uh, underlying key team. Denise, you have the floor. Thank you so much. I'm um, I'm very grateful uh, um, to to the previous panelists because they give me the opportunity to uh, not making the the bad cop as usually, uh, but uh, to um, to ask all of you a question in order to clarify um, the position that I'm. Uh, uh, I'm doing to 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 take my take on uh, the uh, new regulation on AI. So I would like to ask whether or not uh, you consider the results of your research, your output, as a product or uh, as a model. I can perhaps say that for some of you, it is uh, of course model because you belong to pure sciences. Uh, for other of you, I can be in doubt if it is a product or uh, a model, like for the predictive justice we are going to, to, to develop with, uh, with Daniele and, uh, and Giovanni. But I'm pretty sure that, uh, for example, the part of legal reasoning uh, provided by Professor Walker is a product. Uh, so, uh, what what does it change? Um, I, I, let, let's think about it. If it is a product or uh, a model you are going to develop, uh, what does it change from a, a, a legal perspective? Um, well, uh, you all know that on last 21st of April, the European Commission has published uh, uh, the proposal of AI regulation. We were all waiting for for that. Looking uh, uh, at what uh, obligations or, or what kind of consequence it may have on uh, research and development, research and innovation, but also in data science. Uh, so um, we had this idea to to provide to design this kind of uh, awareness panel where. Uh, data science uh, was uh, um, telling us uh, how uh, uh, data science can improve a uh, legal system and how it can impact on a legal system. And uh, so the, the, my, my panel, my presentation is, uh, uh, should be, uh, at, at least at, um, according to the assignment from Giovanni, uh, which is the uh, legal framework applicable, legal framework uh, applicable to um, the different projects uh, you presented. Uh, I do not have an answer. Uh, and uh, I try to 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 explain and to give me to give uh, you a uh, justification. Um, it's true that in the AI regulation proposal, um, it is mentioned the uh, the application of uh, AI solution to uh, the system of justice. Uh, it. Uh, recalls uh, the uh, concept of high risk databases that is one of the main concepts of the AI regulation proposal uh, to which a series of obligations are set in order to be on the one hand compliant with uh, uh, fundamental rights protection and uh, uh, the uh, um, practical ways to be uh, to, to, to ensure and to protect fundamental rights in the practical activities. So on the one hand, in, in terms of compliance, and on the other uh, hand, so high risk database is, is a concept that um, aims at identifying uh, uh, stand, standards 
uh, to be applicable in into different contexts. Uh, so uh, the AI regulation proposal is characterized by three main, uh, uh, we can say, grounds. The first ground is uh, a ground of risk assessment uh, that is provided by the EU Commission itself in uh, uh, identifying whether or not a given uh, database could be considered as a high risk one or not. So if it is the 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 the, the most the, the 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 more strict um, the stricter uh, path of obligations and compliance um, is applicable if uh, a database is considered as a high risk one. Uh, another element that um, is uh, relevant uh, according to uh, the the new proposal is uh, uh, the one relating to the legal framework that is applicable to the AI solution. This is the uh, so-called new legislative framework that is not new because it's new. It's new because it is a list pre-identified of uh, standards and conformity uh, obligations that shall be um, ap applied to a given sector and then to a given product to be put in the market, to be placed in market. Uh, and third, uh, there is a ground of conformity assessment. Why conf a ground of conformity assessment that is not theoretical or by design, it's by default. It's a conformity assessment that the, the developer shall um, comply with in order to put the product into the market. So the AI regulation is not um it, it, it is addressed to put solutions into the market not only to extract no it, it's not a, it is not applicable to uh, uh, the fields of, of for example pure research those research there that are not going to be exploited into the market that's why my first question was is your up, uh, output referred to a product or is it a pure research? Uh, from this perspective, even if we, uh, in, in, from this perspective, the um, notion itself of high risk database recalls on the one hand, the new um, regulation framework that is linked to all these um, standardization and standards or obligations related to the market, to the product. On the other um, hand, uh, the high risk databases refer to AI solution that uh, shall be put in the market or shall be put in, the in a service. That's why the conformity check is one of the main ground of, of the obligations that the developer shall has to uh, follow. Um, the EU Commission helps uh, the developer in, in to identify whether or not the, the AI regulation is applicable to um, his or her uh, solution, uh, thanks to Annex 3 that identifies for eight different sectors. And if you can see the, the sectors are the biometric identification, categorization of natural personnel, uh, management operation and critical uh, infrastructure, education, vocational training, uh, employment, uh, migration, asylum, uh, administration of justice. So if we read just uh, this kind of, of, of sectors, we 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 just we 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 can say oh well we are all all, all AI based solution um, are included in uh, in high risk databases, but the eight these eight sectors um, for each sector there is an example of uh, AI solution that is considered as high risk database. So uh, as far as uh, um, our uh, studies on a legal system, it's true that the uh, AI um, 
solution for predictive justice can be considered as high risk databases, but not in, in all the cases. Uh, the same approach, and uh, I would like just to, to notice this, that the same approach has been uh, introduced also for the machinery products uh, proposal of regulation that has been published uh, on the same day of the AI regulation, so on the 21st of April, and this is applicable not to AI solution for, for products and services, but for assembly uh, fitted with or intended to be fitted with a drive system that other than directly applied to human or animal effort, uh, consisting of linked parts of components, at least one of which moves and which are joined together with a specific application. So the main risk that this kind of machinery products that that you know it, it's more evident the example because it goes beyond the pure sciences it's more applicable science uh, uh, experimental ones um, it refers that the ground of risk assessment uh, towards fundamental rights is more referred to uh, the human health fundamental rights not also to the data protection ones, uh, private life, uh, uh, dignity, uh, and all that grounds that brings the, uh, uh, the, the assessment of the AI regulation proposal to uh, provide a path of different uh, um, grounds and requirements that shall be met in order to produce a trustworthy AI. But, uh, so uh, my qu for question when I read the, 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 the AI regulation was, well, we, we cannot apply it to uh, the studies that we, we, we are developing. But I um, wanted to focus on the AI regal regulatory sandbox Article 53 of the proposal that introduces something that is really, really interesting, uh, I think, for, for our challenges. It introduces the possibility for the competent authorities or the European Data Protection Supervisor to uh, create a controlled environment that facilitates the development, testing, and validation of innovative AI systems for a limited time in order to be able to uh, create a standardization of uh, um, a standardization of the obligations of the um, supervision, liability and governance uh, obligations and to create a robust infrastructure where the uh, AI solution can be tested before being put in, uh, in into the market. So there is still the market products orientation that is driving uh, the, um, the AI proposal, but the fact that uh, uh, it is uh, the real promotion of, of uh, um, an environment where a robust environment where um, AI solution can be tested in order to provide a more compliant and more standardized um, terms of, uh, of trustworthiness of, of the solution developed, I think it's really, really interesting uh, if we consider all the work that we are developing and, and the results of all the projects that have been presented today. In fact, perhaps all of us are creating a kind of analytical sandbox for legal studies. So uh, the, uh, the approach between uh, data science and uh, legal studies is uh, inverted. Uh, it is not the legal framework that makes the data, the, the, the application, the AI solution uh, trustworthy, that makes it uh, legally compliant and uh, um, and uh, could help to standardize it. But we are doing something different. We are using analytical sandboxes, so models of uh, of uh, of uh, taken by from from different branches of data science in order to 
create an innovative legal system in order to um, promote a new methodological approach for our legal studies. So from this perspective, the, uh, the idea is that uh, predictive justice, uh, yes, of course, it could be uh, if we realize a product that can affect uh, the individual cases, the individual, uh, the individual freedoms uh, it may impact on democracy, rule of law by uh, pushing the, the la bouche of the, the, the la loi, the, the, the judges, to interpret by driving the interpretation, judicial interpretation. Yes, it's a high risk database, and we will need to follow uh, all the obligation in order to be compliant. Uh, on the other side, all the activities of anonymization, pseudonymization, and ancillary activities that are functional to the administration of justice, these are all activities that are not considered as high risk um, ones, so they are not uh, included in the application of AI regulation. But I think we uh, can push and address our efforts into identifying this kind of analytical sandboxes in order to uh, create uh, an innovative and to test and validate um, the, 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 uh, our, uh, our legal system or a different legal system in order to uh, improve the dialogue between the different legal formats. I I think at the time we are already in, uh, in delay and it was just a provocation in order to uh, try to put together all the different uh, um, techniques that we heard in, in the different project and move towards uh, the legal studies and the contribution that as a lawyer so we can, we can uh, give to uh, this uh, Fantastic adventure, I can say, because it's not a project, just a project. There are many projects and many uh, so stimulating that we it's a, an adventure and I have, I'm happy to be part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Denise, with, for this, which is much, much beyond the provocation. It's uh, really uh, a framework for uh, for a project and then for uh, moving forward. This is very, very uh, useful and informative. Uh, we are 15 minutes before our our timing, uh, so some people have already uh, unfortunately left. Um, but I think we can uh, take another couple of minutes if there are comments, questions, uh, reactions uh, from uh, people still with with us. Because this has been a long journey, uh, and we put a lot on the plate. We were aware of the time constraints. But the high quality of the speakers and the interaction, as I see in the chat, are already developing further uh, liaison and relationships, scientific ones. So that's great. That's uh, what an awareness panel is, uh, is meant to be. So we are very happy that uh, already some uh, outcomes are, are popping up. All right. So let me once again thank all uh, all the speakers for both uh, their presentations and uh, interaction and for keeping the time. Uh, I'm really uh, deeply in depth with uh, all of them, and uh, just uh, we will uh, certainly follow up with this awareness panel in many many other directions. Thank you to everybody for attending and uh, keep in touch. Thank you much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Grazie, Giovanni. Grazie. Grazie a voi.